Hi, and thank you for joining us today for SNF Agora Conversations, the politics and policy of COVID-19. I'm Jeffrey Kahn, the Andreas E. Dracopoulos Director of the Johns Hopkins Berman Institute of Bioethics. This webcast is produced by the SNF Agora Institute. SNF Agora is a relatively new institute here at Johns Hopkins that examines challenges to democracy and identifies actionable solutions. They created this new weekly series to offer a social, scientific, evidence-based approach to exploring the difficult political and policy issues that are arising right now around the pandemic. I'm excited to be part of it, leading today's conversation on COVID-19 and the ethics of scarce resource planning. Joining me today are two of my colleagues, Ruth Faden, my predecessor as director and founder of the Berman Institute of Bioethics, and the Philip Franklin Wagley Professor of Biomedical Ethics here at Johns Hopkins, and Alan Kachelia, who is Senior Vice President for Patient Safety and Quality at Johns Hopkins Medicine. Thank you both for being here. Today, the three of us will spend about 30 minutes discussing the ethics of scarce resource allocation, how public input can inform how to prioritize members of our communities when there isn't enough of a life-saving scarce resource to go around, as we're hearing um, may be experienced in our communities around the United States and around the globe, and the nearly real-time work being carried out in hospitals in Maryland and across the U.S. and the globe to create ethically acceptable frameworks for the allocation of these life-saving life scarce resources and implementation plans for deciding quite literally who will live and who will die. Once we're done with our first 30 minutes of conversation, we'll open it up for your questions. Anytime throughout our conversation, you can submit your question through the dialog box, which is right next to the video or just below it, depending on your device. Please note that while uh, Dr. Kachelia is a physician. We're not here to answer medical questions on this panel. So with that, let me turn to our first question, which I'd like to direct uh, to Ruth. Triage decisions are often described as among the most wrenching and challenging of bioethics issues, since they require a choice about whose life to save when it is not possible to save everyone who is in need. How has bioethics as a field and the scholars who, who work in it analyzed and tried to answer these types of what are really possibly difficult ethics questions? Thank you, Jeff. They are extremely difficult. We can't allow them to be impossible because they have to be made. Uh, what we do in bioethics is step back initially and try to develop a kind of framework for even thinking about the problem. And I, I believe this is true for all of us. When we think about how to allocate something when everyone can't get it or when everyone can't get enough of it, we really think of this as a, a problem of justice. It's how to allocate fairly, how to justly distribute what we do have to the numbers of people that we can help. How do we pick? And that's a question of justice. I'm going to try to walk us through in like just a couple minutes, a kind of intro to how to think about this that I hope will help frame the, the whole conversation. There are two parts to justice. There's the substantive part. You have to identify the principles or the rules that you're going to use to allocate the scarce resource. Let's say it's ventilators or let's say it's units of blood. And then we also need a process to make sure that whatever the rules are that are adopted, they are in fact adhered to fairly impartially uh, as best as possible. So think a little bit like a criminal justice system. You've got the code of laws, and then you've got the court, you've got the judge, you've got the jury, you've got the defense attorney, you've got the attorney for the uh, state. All of that is the process to implement the rules that have been codified. I'm going to only talk for the rest, for the, in my, really quickly now, Jeff, about the substantive principles, because I have a feeling we'll talk a lot about the process later. In terms of the substantive principles in ethics, we usually land on two big ones when it comes to an allocation of scarce resources. Let's call one the principle of efficiency and the other one the principle of equality. So the efficiency principle enjoins us to maximize the amount of good that we can get from the resources that we have available. The good in our case is health. So we're trying to maximize the, you know, the health that we can secure for the, allo the ventilators that we have available. That would be the principle of efficiency. 
the principle of equality says we have to allocate the resources in such a way that each of us, each of us um, is recognized as foundationally morally equal, that we're all equally morally worthy. At minimum, the equality principle requires that we rule out any criterion that would be considered um, obviously morally irrelevant. So the, these are the easy ones to list off. Gender, race, income, ethnicity, social standing. We'll have more kind of conversations about others later on. But these are all criteria that we would consider morally irrelevant. And using any of them would be a violation of the principle of equality. <clears throat> Excuse me. We are talking too much lately. That's our standard line. Landing on these two big principles is the easy part. The hard part, the really hard part, is figuring out, do we use only one? Do we use both? Do we use some combination? And also within that, how do we cash them out? So just, can I speak for one more minute, Jeff? We have another minute. Thanks. Just to cash this out, because I know we want a conversation, just to cash this out, to give you an illustration of what we're struggling with. You can cash out. Excuse me. You can cash out the principle of efficiency a number of different ways. The two main candidates, you either want to maximize the number of lives saved, so that's literally maximizing the number of people, or you might want to maximize the number of years of lives saved. Those are two different ways of cashing out the principle of efficiency. The principle of equality also admits of lots of ways to cash it out. So I've already mentioned the kind of low-hanging fruit of just discarding what are obviously morally irrelevant ways in which we might seemingly appear different, but they don't matter to our moral equality. But what about characteristics that might matter? So, for example, heroism and sacrifice, right? Are those of us who have not sacrificed, who are not essential workers, really standing in equal relation to the people who have? Maybe they should get priority. Another one is stages of life. Some of us say, doesn't matter how old we are, the only thing we have left to lose in the face of death is the rest of our lives. We're all equal in that. Other people will say, you know, that's not quite the way to think about it. What should be equalized or understood to be a concern for equality is how long you get to live. And therefore, younger people have a greater claim because they haven't reached later stages of life than older people who have already gotten there. So this is just to give you some intro feeling for the kinds of issues that we think about from the standpoint of bioethics. So that was really helpful. And I, I want to actually maybe ask Ellen a, a different question, but then we connect up what you just said, I think, in the application. So okay. Ellen, if, if I could turn to you, um, and among the things that you are engaged in, I know you're incredibly busy. So among the things I should say at the outset is thank you for taking the time out. But you're involved with uh, the planning process here at, at Hopkins, um, and, and I think, too, to help inform hospitals around the state. And so I'd like you to spend a little time talking about, as hospitals like ours and, and states like Maryland face the prospect of a surge in cases of um, COVID-19 illness, what kinds of things are likely to be in short supply and how do clinicians like you and, and hospital leaders like you think about shortages in general and those posed by COVID-19 pandemic in particular? Yeah, so, um, you know, I have to say that in general, uh, we've been lucky in our country that we actually don't frequently have to worry about the shortages that we're worried about on the scale that we may have to see them on. And as a result, our general philosophy with hospitals has been a pretty simple one, which is that if we think we're going to run low on something that's important, we try to figure out how to get more. And our supply chains have traditionally been so reliable that we can usually navigate our way through that. And it turns out, again, the principle here is to make sure that we have enough supply for our patients. Now, that's actually pretty much how we're trying to prepare with regard to COVID-19 as well. Um, and that's why you're seeing um, hospitals trying to um, go down on their volume because the idea is that if we have less patients in the hospitals, mm -hmm. they, uh, the better we can be prepared for the big surge. Now, of course, the big question, concern that we have over the surge 
is a rather simple one. We're worried that one, the patients will come so fast that we won't have time to get more supplies if we need them, or that even if we have the time, the market, the demand might be so great for everything that there just won't be our ability to get these supplies. And I think the, the items that we worry most about right now are ventilators, um, because this is a respiratory disease. We worry about blood. Interestingly, not because we think the demand will go up, but because we think the supply will go down uh, because not many people are donating like they used to. We're worried about certain medications that people think may treat the disease, things like hydrochloroquine. Uh, and as people talk about convalescent plasma as a potential treatment, we have to think about how we will allocate that because that will be a scarce resource as well. And again, the key here is that we just need to prepare so that when the time comes, we have a good process in place. So uh, among the things that I think you, you said there, Alan, was really the first order of, of effort is to flatten the curve, as we've read about in the media, heard about, reported a lot, and your, your notion of keeping the volume down will help us not need to think about triage. But, um, of course, the concern is that that may not be the case everywhere across the country. We seem to have been lucky so far in Maryland that that is the case. We flatten the curve. But the things you talked about as being in short supply need to sort of be um, focused on in light of the way Ruth described balancing efficiency and equity or equality, right? That's the tension, right? So when push comes to shove, we're going to have to figure out what to do. And you know, among the things we in bioethics have been I guess in some sense blessed with is the ability to do our work from 10,000 feet. We haven't, it's been hypothetical in large part. We're, we're no longer in hypothetical situations and, you know, it's always different in, in the, when you're facing real life. And so I, I want to bring us together here, but to do that, I'd like to ask Ruth to talk about a process, uh, a project actually, that the state of Maryland had the foresight to undertake now almost 15 years ago after the H1N1 um, outbreak that has been widely cited and used as a basis for scarce resource planning here at Hopkins for sure and, and across Maryland, but really around the country. Um, I know, Ruth, that you were part of the project team, and I wonder if you can do a really quick summary of that work, um, why it's important for the cur current planning and, and response and how it does the work of balancing efficiency and um, equality. Yeah, it was it, it was a privilege to be part of this project, and I just want to tip my hat to Lee Doherty Bittison, who is a leader of this effort and a, a colleague in intensive care medicine. She, she she kept us going and 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 was the force behind all of our efforts. This project started because we were in what we thought was potentially a similar situation for H1N1 in the 2009 uh, avian flu pandemic. And I was part of a group that we led then to try to actually figure out what we would do if, if we were to be short of ventilators in particular. We, we did that work. Fortunately, we didn't need to implement what we had concluded would be an appropriate process and, and set of principles, but we felt very dissatisfied for a number of reasons. One, we had to do this in such short compass. And two, we've never had an opportunity to uh, hear from the people who are going to be affected by this, that is to say, in this case, the citizens of Maryland. We wanted to understand better what the values were of the community. So this led to a very long project that started in 2009 and ended in 2019. So this is sort of a 10 year stretch where um, the, the centerpiece and the part that I think is the most important in terms of uh, what you asked, Jeff, in terms of what's most important for the current process uh, that we're in, was that we did have an opportunity to hold day-long meetings with 300 citizens of Maryland across the strait. Uh, about half were regular, we, we would consider civilians, not healthcare workers, and the other half were people in the healthcare field in emergency response and so on. And what we did with these what with, with these people did is they spent a whole day in a hotel room. Uh, can, first, we had an expert panel explain the problem. They had a, a bunch of materials that laid before them six different candidate moral principles for how to allocate ventilators in the case of a pandemic. In this case, we presented them with a flu pandemic, flu, COVID-19. The idea was ventilators were in short supply. The... Um, 
participants, the community members, met in small groups around tables. They uh, would listen to the experts for a bit. They would deliberate each principle. They would argue back and forth with one another. They would ask questions. We were around in case they wanted any answers, questions, any questions answered. And in the end, uh, they had to sort of express their view and see if each group could come to agreement or consensus about anything. It was a remarkable process, and I, it, it really um, buoyed all of our confidence in the capacity of all of us to, to think through these morally dilemmatic challenges. So while those of us in bioethics, Jeff and I, have this special sort of analytic expertise, it's in all of us to deal with uh, these difficult uh, decisions, although we none of us want to. I will just hit a couple of the highlights of, of uh, what the group kind of consensus came to. There was a view that we needed to think about who would survive, who needed the ventilator the most, who would survive, uh, most likely with it. There was a concern about long-term survival, but this group, and it was so prescient, landed on um, an immediate concern that if we focused on how many years of life would be saved, right, this could introduce unintentionally tremendously um, unfair impact on disadvantaged groups for a slew of reasons, right? All the things we're seeing playing out right now in the COVID-19 pandemic is what our group anticipated, that it could look like on the surface, like it was a nice neutral principle, but in fact, it would hit hardest people who were the least advantaged, people who were poor, people of color, for all the reasons we know now, higher um, background comorbidities, so they have shortened life expectancies as a group generally, uh, more likely to be out there in essential work contexts, and therefore more likely to contract the illness and so on. Anyway, so they gave us that big caution, and we listened really hard. Another big caution they had was about age. They were very wary about the use of age, but they did like the idea of using stages of life as a tiebreaker down the road not as a first-line principle. Mm -hmm. We took this process, uh, everything we learned from listening to the community, and admittedly, 300 people, not a random sample. They were just people who were willing to give up a day, answer an ad in a newspaper or radio. Um, we, we had two meetings with experts. We introduced them to what we learned from the community group. We had done our own moral analysis. We then kept back in the end there were about eight of us i guess and we hammered out what has come to be called the maryland framework and um in a nutshell the the maryland framework as it was published in 2019 the one that jeff you've referenced as being looked at by uh, people around the country had two core principles first um, a way of scoring people so that they we could distinguish between those people who were most likely to survive uh, through the process of ICU admission and ventilation or treatment in particular. And then secondly, uh, whether they would, after being weaned off the ventilator, be likely to live for one year. So this was the incredible um, sort of blending of a focus on a principle of efficiency. We want to save as many people as we can. That's the injunction to triage based on who's most likely to survive ventilator treatment, but we also want to be very cognizant of deep concerns about structural injustice and the possibility of unequal, unfair unequal treatment, and therefore we want to make sure that any consideration for how long you survive afterwards would be limited to only one year. The notion being that uh, to allocate a ventilator to someone who is already so ill from something else that they are not expected to live the year anyway was something that um, our citizens group also thought was inappropriate. So those are the two key mm -hmm. principles with stage of life, <clears throat> over, a special nod, and you can talk about this later if there's time to pregnancies. And pregnant women pose a particular challenge to um, uh, allocation and triage criteria, which we can talk about. Later. Sure. So, so great. And, and so all very, um, hugely helpful and, and a great process and very informative for what we are facing. But informative in prospect is different than implementing in reality. And so I want to I turn to Alan and ask, 
um, you know, sort of what in the work that you've been leading in uh, planning for scarce resource allocation um, has been different about what will be implemented here or what, what the thinking has been that's, that's sort of taken what the project Ruth worked on gave us and <clears throat> in its implementation had to change or was influenced by the realities of this particular pandemic? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think Ruth covered many of the key points here, and I just want to reiterate a few of them quickly, which is that we were lucky that this group in Maryland laid the foundation for us because what it did was it prevented many of us from having to reinvent the wheel and decide what principles we wanted to follow. Mm -hmm. And it also gave us insight into what members of the public wanted because that is such a essential component to this and saved us a lot of time in preparation. And of course, this framework was built in a non-pressured environment, which allowed thoughtful deliberation, which allowed us to rely on it even more. Now that said, Jeff, as you pointed out earlier, um, we can think of things in the hypothetical, but when we try to implement them, there are other considerations or characteristics that come up that we need to think more about. And of course, the biggest one when it comes to triage decisions has to do with making sure that what we're doing is one, in line with public sentiment, and two, in line with the law, um, because you have to follow the law. And uh, interestingly enough, we've been following reports from across the country, and this whole concept, our team believed in this whole concept of years of life and how much, uh, the stages of life, as Ruth put it. But, you know, there's still a fair amount of concern that this could be seen as discriminating on the basis of age. So, you know, we've had to take that into consideration as we try to build out our framework. We've seen articles come out saying that we need to think about giving preference to healthcare workers or first responders because it makes a lot of sense to protect those who are going to protect us. But I have to tell you, when we talk about sentiment in the law, it's seen by problematic as some because that it may be seen as introducing bias that we don't want in, in our math here. So I, I think those are the key things to think about. And of course, the other big one as a matter of practicality is we, we've learned that we can't just adopt one framework and one process and apply it to every scarce resource. It turns out each resource has its own challenges and we have to map out what, what are the characteristics that we'll evaluate these by and map out the process by which we'll execute on this. So we built out a process for events. We were hoping we could use the same one for blood. Turned out we couldn't, and we needed something completely different. Mm -hmm. And then we went to ICU beds. We realized we needed another different framework to build this on, or a different process to build this on. So it turns out to be incredibly time intensive. And I'd say that's probably the biggest difference, which is taking theory and putting into application just takes a lot more effort. I think those are all really great points. And, I, and one was sort of last follow up, and then I'm going to ask you a final question before we go to the audience. <laughs> and, and that is, you know, it's it, all of this very hard and good work in prospect um, that Ruth's group did, and then the work that you've led here at, at Hopkins, Alan, um, abuts the sort of real politic of when people start to think about what will happen to them. Um, lawsuits and, and um, you know, challenges ensue. And so among the things, I mean, to, to be a little more specific about your, your point, advocacy groups have, have brought legal challenges on the basis of federal anti-discrimination law, right, to, to defend appropriately, defend the rights of people who are, um, you know, disabled or, or, you know, to prevent discrimination based on age or um, socioeconomic status or ethnic background or a whole long list of things. And so, you know, part of the lesson, it seems, is we can do this work in prospect and we can then craft implementation plans, but then all of that meets up with a sort of, you know, politics and, and law uh, and policy, all of which has somehow square as we try to implement in the context of emergency. Yeah, you know, all of that making it all a bit more challenging. I don't know if either of you have comments about that before we, I want to ask you each one last question before Q&A. Ask your last question. Okay. So my last question um, to each of you um, is the following. Let's start with Ruth. I know that, that you, like all of us, have been reading, watching, listening to many, many things about the outbreak and, and what we and need to do in reaction and um, how we plan our way out of this for the last few weeks. What, what concerns you the most from an ethics perspective about what you've learned? And maybe on the other side, what heartens you the most? 
So I, um, I'm going to restrict my focus to the problem at hand, right? There's lots, so many things worry me about this that, you know, we, we, don't, we, can, we don't have enough time. But I would say I'd like to start with what heartens me. What heartens me is something that Alan said a little bit ago, which is it looks like there's a decent chance that we won't have to implement frameworks like this one. Frameworks, ex, you know, explicated and specified and made practical through the process that Alan led. So with any luck, we won't have to do this. And, you know, there, there was one thing, and it's so obvious that the participants in our process said, the first thing they said is, can't, can't we get out of this? Like, do we have to really do this? Is there some way that we could get enough ventilators so everybody could have one? And I guess we should just be, you know, keep hoping that because of all the shared efforts to flatten the curve, because of all of the efforts that have been taken to decompress in the hospital, um, that maybe we won't have to implement this, which would be fantastic, right? Great work, put it away for the next one, right? We all build on this. So that's what heartens me. What worries me is that we screw it up as we move back into the world, as we open up and we lighten up that we mess this all up and we end up having to use the framework anyway. So what heartens me is the chance that we don't have to. What scares whatever out of me is the thought that we can mess this up and find ourselves and dodge one bullet only to get shot a second time. That's my big concern uh, that's specific to this. But a couple of more, a couple more. I am worried about hospitals and health systems that don't have a framework, that don't have a process, that didn't have the background work that uh, Lee's, Lee's group, the group that I was part of, led that didn't have the experience and the leadership and all of the effort, and Jeffy were part of this, that Alan led, and they faced this. So I worry a lot about that. I worry about um, hospitals that are small and can't have the process that we didn't discuss with a triage officer and a triage team and a review team, all of that kind of stuff. So I worry about that. I worry about whether we've done enough or can do enough to get community input and community engagement. And it's the most awful thing in the world that I can imagine is finding out that your loved one didn't get a ventilator because of some criteria that you don't understand, some process that you've never heard of uh, by some people you don't know, that you can't even see and you can't even argue with. So somehow we need a way of getting the community broadly, right, to understand this in prospect. And today is a wonderful way to do that. And finally, I worry a lot, a lot, a lot about what we're seeing with, when I said our group is prescient, they were very prescient, our participants. And of course, we worry about this in structural justice theory anyway, that the people who are least disadvantaged, least advantaged, least disadvantaged in our society are dying at much higher rates, uh, whether that's um, people of color in Queens, or it's meatpacker process people in uh, a pork plant, right? Yeah. What I worry about is whether the triage systems around the country are going to be able to uh, not make that worse. I think, and from what I what I understand, ours, if it is implemented, shouldn't. But it's a really, really deep worry. So I'll start with my uplifting. That's a, that's a long list. I know. Yeah. Um, so, Alan, um, same same question to you, and, and you can answer it from, you know, whatever perspective you like, but obviously um, your role on the front lines for planning and delivery of care is a good frame. I'd say the, there are many things that concern me about this. The two biggest ones are probably the first one is how will this go for families and patients? Right. This is just a, this would be an absolutely terrible situation if their family member's sick enough or the patient's sick enough, and then we have to add triage to all of this. So I worry about how we are going to make sure that we communicate sincerely, clearly, and with empathy with these patients and families if we have to go through this. And that's going to be hard because if we're in a situation where we're triaging or allocating, we know the hospital is going to be full to the max and everyone's going to be working to take care of that surge. So I think one of the biggest things that I, I worry about is that will hospitals be prepared to support patients and families as they go through this? And when you add the additional piece of the fact that many family members or patients may not even be allowed to, family members, not patients, family members may not be allowed to visit uh, during the pandemic if we get into a certain situation.
Uh, this also leads me to my second concern, which is our clinicians. People didn't go into healthcare to allocate resources. They went in there to give what they could to help others get better. Uh, I think clinicians see themselves as patient advocates and having to allocate runs absolutely contrary to that. So <clears throat> if people are forced to withdraw care, you can imagine, <clears throat> excuse me, how taxing it would be on them. And I think we also have to figure out how we're gonna support the clinicians. So at the end of the day, with regard to hospitals getting this right, it's about communicate, communicate, and communicate so that everybody understands, execute as well as you can on the plan, and of course, as more data comes in, be ready to be adept and be nimble. Mm -hmm. um, that said, the things that hurt me the most, I think there's two. Uh, oh. we, we see this in the press every day. These first responders and healthcare workers that we're talking about, they're putting themselves at risk and they keep showing up to work and keep doing what they need to do to help people get better. And it's just amazing and heartening to me to watch this happening. And I can see, I've seen it here in our hospital too. People just keep showing up and saying, what do we need to do? Let's get through this. Uh, so it's just incredibly inspiring. And the other one that heartens me goes back to what Ruth said. The early reports that we think that social distancing is working. Today was supposed to be the peak day in Maryland, and you can see that most of our hospitals still have capacity. So my hope is, is if the public's gotten the message and stays home and we continue to do this, we will not have to use one ounce of this work, and there is nothing that would make me happier. I love that. That's a really perfect um, end to our conversation together. So thank you both for a great conversation. And now um, let's take a few questions from the audience, and let me say as I turn to the list to remind those of you who are watching, if you have a question for our panel, you can ask it through the dialog box on the screen um, next to or below the video. And please remember, we're not going to answer um, medical questions. So let me look here and turn my head here for a second. So one thing, this is a, a, a straightforward question. I'm gonna ask Alan to address it um, because in addition to being a physician Alan also has a legal degree, um, and the question is what legal protections are in place for healthcare systems, and I would, I guess, add to that, and providers that have to make these sorts of decisions. Yeah, that's a great question, and, you know, uh, liability law is always governed at the state level, so everyone needs to understand that it's a state-by-state -state determination, and what you have to look at is what, are the, what would be a, the general standard is what would a reasonable physician do in these circumstances, and, of course, the public, juries, doctors often differ on what's reasonable, so you have to keep that in mind. So what states, some states are doing is they're either issuing by executive order or by law um, standards that they want clinicians to follow when it comes to a pandemic like this. And the idea is that if you follow those standards, which give you a little bit more latitude in triaging, uh, that you can be granted additional legal immunity. Uh, you should also realize that in some states, uh, like Maryland, for example, there are laws that call for a process that clinicians have to follow if they want to override a patient's wishes. Again, something that could happen in a triage situation. And it's up to the states to make sure that they are addressing those laws so that if this allocation has to happen, that there's additional protection provided. That's great. Um, this next I want to direct to Ruth. And you get a little shout out here. Big fan of your work, the question says. I was wondering if the uh, inequalities intrinsic in our healthcare system, that is, who has access to or can afford healthcare, were taken into account in the framework that you described. Yeah, 100%. So uh, thank you for the shout out. I appreciate it. And um, to you especially, whoever asked that question, yeah, <laughs> we're, we, worried, we worried about this tremendously. And so interestingly did our participants. So to give you a concrete example, it's not just inequalities baked into our healthcare system, it's inequalities baked into our whole social structure. Uh, we, when the group, the, the group of citizens across the state of Maryland discussed the first comfort serve principle as maybe, you know, a neutral principle, whoever gets there first until they're all used up, can't we go that way? Or when open, a ventilator opens up, why can't we just take the person who's next in line and kill them, right? Immediately, people landed on the fact that, wow, who's going to get to the healthcare system first, right? Even if you could make that work as a practical matter, who's going to show up first? Who has use of transportation? Who knows where to go? Who has um, a primary care physician that they can contact who will triage them and tell them it's time? 
it was immediately clear, even though that was not ever really a very viable principle, that you have to take account of so many ways in which people who are disadvantaged generally are really, really disadvantaged now. Uh, and the main reason, right, the main reason why we recommended only using one year of life right, rather than number of years of life saved was uh, because we recognized that there are so many reasons why people are ha um, have shortened life expectancy that have to do with the social um, predictors of health, the social predictors, as well as the access to health care, all of which is profoundly unfair. So the last thing you want to do is take unfair background conditions, ignore them, create a framework for allocating life-saving treatments that has the effect of exacerbating what are already deep structural injustices. So we work really, really hard to try to minimize that insofar as possible. Great. All right, I'm going to pitch this one back to, to you, Alan, um, and it's about DNR policies. Uh, the question is, are DNR policies ethical to put in place for COVID-19 patients as CPR puts both parties, the patient and clinician, at increased risk? Is there a discussion about futility in these cases? And I know we have talked about this on a committee that you are leading. Yeah, this is a really hard question to answer. And it, it's not a scarce resource issue. It's one more of how do you balance treating a patient versus that versus the risk to the people who are going to take care of the patient in part. Um, and of course, added to this is that there's data showing that when people are really sick with COVID, if you code them, it, it, sometimes people don't recover from it. Um, I can tell you that a lot of people are grappling with what to do about patients' code status. Here, um, here at our hospital, we've decided that everybody, we're, it's, we're going to continue as is, which means that if somebody needs to be coded or resuscitated, we will do so, but the debate's going to continue. And I wish I had a clear answer on this one, but it, it's not an easy one to answer. No, and, and, and there's been a lot of, um, I think, concern across the communities that pay attention to um, issues related to DNR, DNI, about whether there would be automatic DNR for patients who were COVID positive on admission to hospitals. And I know you just said about Hopkins is we are not doing that. But other, other places, at least the scuttlebutt is, are actually making that judgment. Yeah, and I, I will point out that, you know, you can mitigate a lot of the risk if you wear the N95 masks, right? So people worry about the aerosolization that occurs during CPR. There's no question about it. But by wearing the mask uh, properly, you should be protected. So you need to have masks to wear, which is one of the the shortage issues, right? That is correct. Yeah. So let me um, let me ask one more, and then we may need to wrap up, depending how long it takes to answer this one. So what? So this is a, a sort of emerging issue. What differences um, are there in allocating convalescent plasma? And there's going to need to be a little bit of explanation. Maybe Alan, you can do that. What that means that may not be present when we're talking about triage of ventilators and ICU beds? And should hospital systems develop separate processes for, for these kinds of questions? Right, so convalescent plasma, just briefly, I think just to make sure everybody's on the same page, the idea is that after someone's been infected with or has had COVID-19, uh, uh, they develop antibodies to it if they've recover, recovered from it. So the idea is to take plasma from patients that have these antibodies in them and then give the antibodies to other patients, the theory being that the antibodies might help them fight off disease. Um, this is something that people are hailing as having a lot of promise. I will point out that we don't know yet if it works or doesn't work. Um, and we've had a lot of debate internally as to how we will allocate this too, because in the case of convalescent plasma, you, we actually don't know if it's a beneficial treatment or if it will actually do more harm than good if you give it to somebody. We also don't know if it's more benefit to patients who are sicker or more benefit to patients who are less sick because you benefit from having it early in the disease. So uh, in terms of equity, what we've been talking about or what a lot of people here are talking about is that maybe uh, a scarce resource like this should be allocated on a lottery system simply because we don't know who it would benefit the most or who it could harm the most. And there's a lot more conversation to come on this as this becomes more available. Yeah, and, and Ruth, you may, I don't know if you've been paying attention to this issue at all, it's really a new and emerging one, but 
to complicate it even more, there are clinical trials that are being developed and yeah. whether that should be a way that we should prioritize access. It's not clear how scarce a resource convalescent plasma will be. It needs to come from donors who have recovered from infection. So it's, a, it's in some sense a more complicated and more difficult to get your hands around issue than you know, triage of things like ventilators and ICU beds. You know, standardly, when you have an unproven treatment, an unproven intervention, let's not use the word treatment, you have an unproven intervention uh, and is in scarce supply. The combination together, the ethics scale tips in the direction of using a research protocol so that you can maximize what you learn and then ultimately benefit more people sooner because you learn more quickly exactly the answers to challenge questions, right? Standing against that are the sort of compelling uh, needs of people who are seriously ill or on the path to becoming seriously ill of a disease for which we do not have good management. So you've got research ethics in this case and clinical ethics in tension uh, and the research ethics tips in the direction of you know, public health priority. It's, as you say, Jeff, it's super complicated. It's a tangled one. Um, unfortunately, I think we need to, to end here. Um, there are more questions and we could have a much longer conversation. It's been great to have you both. I, I need to say thank you to both Ruth and Alan for joining me here today. And thanks to our audience for watching and for sending in your great questions. Please join the uh, group here again next Friday for a conversation on COVID-19 and the dynamics of race and othering, moderated by SNF Agor Institute Director Hari Han. The guest for next week will be Erin Chung, who's an associate professor of East Asian politics here at Johns Hopkins, and Jamila Mishner, an assistant professor in the Department of Govern Government pardon me, at Cornell University. I also want to mention that a recording of today's webcast will be available at snfagora.jhu.edu. Thanks, and I hope to see you again next week.